Inclusive Development 2019. I'm your host, Subek Shakhadka, and thank you so much one more time for sparing your entire day for this conference. And yes, talking about today's event. Social protection undoubtedly has emerged as a major new focus in efforts to reduce poverty all around the world. This two-day conference aims to support the government of Nepal and its relevant ministries to deliver in its vision of a core package of social protection for all and become a prosperous nation focusing on the next generation and of course the vulnerable one as well. The organizing committee believes that if we bring regional as well as international experiences, research and expertise, then together we can create a great change and support Nepal to achieve the ambition that it has looked at and of course the main vision of the conference. This conference, to let you all know, uh, it's organized by the government of Nepal in collaboration with ILO, GIZ, the World Bank, UNDP, UNESCAP, UNICEF, uh, UNICEF UKAID, and Social Science, Baha. To let you all know, throughout the conference, we will be having a panel discussion where we will have uh, personalities from different walks of life, from various organizations sharing their expertise, discussing and addressing various agendas, and of course, together solving and trying to make the most out of the sessions. To begin with, uh, formally, I would like to request all of you to kindly rise from your seat to respect the national anthem. Sayu punga full kahani yote mana nepali Sarva bhumbai pai di eka mezi mahakali Sayu punga full kahani yote mana nepali Sarva bhumbai pai di eka mezi mahakali Prakriti ka koti koti sampada ko achala Thank you so much everybody. I request all of you to kindly take your seats. Now may I request our chief guest of today's event, Honorable Dr. Yuvraj Khatiwada, Minister of Finance, to kindly do the honor of inaugurating the ceremony by lighting the panels. Let's give a very big round of applause, everybody. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister, Dr. Yuvraj Khatiwada. And of course, one more time, we're very glad and pleased to have you here at the conference here today. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to begin with our first inauguration session, uh, wh where we will be discussing about uh, social protection in South Asia, investing in an inclusive future. And for this session, uh, may I invite Honorable Dr. Ram Kumar Fuyal, who is going to chair the session, who is the member of National Planning Commission. Let's give a very big round of applause and welcome him on stage, please. Next, may I invite uh, Dr. Hussein Zilar Rahman, Executive Chairperson of Power and Participation Research Center and Chairperson of Brak Bangladesh. He's one of the keynote speaker here today. And let's give a very big round of applause, everybody. Thank you.
Next, I would like to call upon the representative of UNICEF Nepal, Ms. Elke Whisk. Let's join our hands together and welcome her on stage as well. Today, uh, for this inauguration session, we also had Ms. Ida, uh, World Bank Country Director for Nepal, uh, Sri Lanka and Maldives. But unfortunately, uh, we don't have her here because of her own personal issues. Uh, but on behalf, uh, we have Mr. Bigyan Pradhan, Acting Country Manager of World Bank Nepal. Uh, let's join our hands and welcome him to join on the inauguration session. I would, I would also like to call upon uh, Ms. Lisa Honan, head of DFID Nepal. Let's uh, give a big round of applause everybody and invite her on stage. And yes, uh, last, last but not the least, uh, we would like to call upon our chief guest of today's conference, Honorable uh, Minister Dr. Yuvraj Khatiwada, Minister of Finance, Nepal, uh, to kindly join for this session. One more time, let's give a very big round of applause to the entire inaugural sessions uh, panel panelists here on stage, everybody. To begin with, uh, we would like to call upon Dr. Hussein Zalar Rahman uh, to share uh, some insight and, of course, uh, the keynote speaker of this session. Uh, please, may I invite you, sir? Your Excellency, the Chief Guest, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be here at this important conference trying to scale up social protection in South Asia. It's an agenda which is extremely important for the vulnerable and the poor of this region. But uh, I want to start off by briefly arguing why this agenda is important and why it is very important that we have the Minister of Finance here as the chief guest because it is a signal that the social protection agenda is not an add-on agenda to the growth agenda. It's part of the central uh, central uh, part of our overall development discourse. I think that point needs to be highlighted and I think I just go through these four rationales that I think is important to bear in mind. There is of course the inclusion has become so much more important in today's world, given the rising inequality and all that, and the SDG imperative in, encapsulated in those three wo uh, four words, leaving no one behind. I think that's a very important global message around which we have to construct our larger st strategy. But I think the social protection agenda is also a means not just, it's not a technocratic exercise of some programs only, but it is also a means to, in a way, reorient the philosophy of the development discourse. It's not just growth, and I think we need prosperity, but we also need happiness, meaning all people need to be contented at the life opportunities opening up for them. So this prosperity has to be linked with happiness as a larger development philosophy for our region and for the world actually as a whole. And that's where I think the focus on social protection is also a way to reorient the development philosophy, so to say, which is also very critical in today's world. And I think it's important to highlight that South Asia in particular, in terms of its history, has what I call a redistributive ethos as one of its inherent social capital type ideas. That you, in local communities, you always feel that the worse off need to be taken care of by the community itself. I think the redistributive ethos is a very important social capital heritage of South Asia and building on that is a way to expand the social protection uh, agent. And of course, lastly, I think we also realize as a whole, investing in human capital has to be a 
the core driver of the type of new programming that we are looking for and the type of new ambitions we are trying to set for ourselves because at the end of the day, intergenerational poverty is also a very important concern. So for that also we need to invest in human capital. So I think social protection, a resilient, inclusive social protection is an agenda in its own right, but it is also a trigger to try and infuse the larger development discourse on larger goals of inclusion, on happiness, on the future generations. And I think that should be the right uh, sort of mood for this conference to try and find out the specific ways forward. I think here is also important that obviously we are not planning or strategizing in vacuum. There are contextual factors of importance which need to be taken on board. As we know, Nepal was a victim particularly of the devastating earthquake. We know that so disaster and climate vulnerability is on the rise. That's something we have to factor in as we look for new ways to advance the social protection agenda. Rapid and unplanned urbanization is a reality across South Asia, bringing within, uh, in its wake many new challenges that has to be factored in. We also need to be aware that if we look at our demographic depopulation pyramid, the demographic window of opportunity, the dividend window, is a time-bound one. Roughly another 12, 15, 20 years max for this part of the region. And aging will also come in, will, there will be an onset of aging challenges earlier than in other areas. So the time-limited demographic dividend window means that investing in human capital cannot be an agenda just to be discussed and decided on later. We have to act now. There is an urgency of action because of this time-limited demographic dividend window. We also have, in terms of uh, an epidemiological transition with the NCDs, you know, uh, becoming much more important than the earlier ones on the communicable diseases. The non-communicable diseases are becoming a greater concern and that impacts on this happiness and the health and all those indicators. One factor I haven't put up, uh, I've uh, overlooked in putting up in this contextual factor of importance is the whole issue of migration. That's also very important in this part of the world. Uh, rural urban, rural rural, in between countries and how the migrants uh, social protection needs are addressed and also those of the host communities. Those are I think issues that we need to take on board. Lastly, I think in terms of the contextual factors, I would say that in terms of the governance pathways forward, there is a plurality of pathways and, and there are multi-stakeholder sort of realities. There is the government, there is the local government, there is the civil society, there is the communities themselves, and how we craft the relative linkages between these entities, I think will be critical for the success on the social protection agenda coming up. Now, the whole idea is not, obviously you're not starting in vacuum. The context for this conference, I understand, is that the issue is about scaling up. We have to scale up. There are multiple programs in Nepal, in Bangladesh, in India, elsewhere, which are already ongoing. But the whole point is that social protection needs to be scaled up. And we need a national, each country has a need for a national strategy. For example, Bangladesh adopted a national strategy in 2015, which provides a framework for how to move forward in the future. So I think the, there is the, uh, a national strategy for scaling up, I guess will be the core uh, focus of this two days conference, multiple sessions, I guess we'll look at this. But here I want to, at the beginning, highlight that a national, when you talk of a national strategy, it is important to distinguish between at least three dimensions. There are the policy priorities, there's the institutional priorities, and there is the implementation priorities. I think all needs to be kept in focus 
as we are thinking of a national strategy. It's not just a document, but if you want to make the national strategy real in terms of its eventual impact on the ground, we have to consider policy, institutional priorities, and implementation priorities. And as you can see, in the policy priorities, obviously reducing poverty and promoting inclusive economic growth is a key focus. Uh, enabling households to deal better with risk and vulnerability is a uh, key focus. And also ensuring human capital is a key focus. But I think, uh, again, I applaud the presence of the finance minister here, because at the end of the day, uh, we'll also have to need the resources. So a sustainable financing strategy is a very important integral part uh, an associated part of the national strategy. I think that needs to be kept in mind. We need to have the institutional priorities also right, and particularly the clarity on the delineation of roles and responsibilities. Everyone has a role to play. The central ministries, the planning commission, the finance ministry, the implementing ministry, the various tiers of the local government, NGO, civil society, delineation of the uh, effective division of labor among these entities, I think is a key issue. And uh, is also very important at this point in time, I think across the region, this is being highlighted, that we need a stronger database on the poor. Uh, building a social registry is a key. Uh, and I think this needs to be highlighted very strongly. Building a social registry is not a one-time affair. It has to be updated regularly as an instrument to guide so, uh, programs on the ground. So I think that is very important. And the participatory approach to building this strategy is also very important. We need to hear the voices of multiple stakeholders. And at the end of the day, it's not just a, uh, just a labor. It adds value because you can get multiple voices into the process of actual uh, development of the strategy. And you also need uh, effective contextualization of the uh, global and regional lessons. It's, I think, very important for countries. Each country has their own specificities. There are useful lessons from the region, from the global experience. But it is important to recontextualize it and not uncritically just add on those lessons to our national strategies. In terms of the uh, implementation priorities, I think it's very important uh, now that a monitoring framework is in place because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, people, the happiness on the people's faces will only come if there is actual outcome on the ground. So monitoring is very important. And I think it's, I wanted to flag this at the very outset, that the monitoring task is a two-tier task. You have to monitor the process, and you have to monitor the outcome. Both are very important. The process ensures that the outcomes are better. You need to know the, what's happening on the ground. So it's a two-tier framework that we should be highlighting. We should also... And I think there are countries have windows of opportunities, political windows of opportunities, particularly where there are consensus on scalable programs. If there are already programs on the ground which have scalable potential, and I think uh, like child benefit or disability grant, uh, programs like this, if there are opportunities for scaling up, building a consensus and then acting on that, I think would be very useful. And it is also very important, as we move forward, that these, as I mentioned, these new contextual factors, that there are, we take cognizance and address the emerging challenges. I want to highlight four. I'm sure there are others. And these are not just specific to one country. I think these are across the region. One is the issue of urban poverty. Largely, we have been successful, more or less, in trying to understand and address rural poverty. Urban poverty is a relatively new phenomena, and we need instruments and plans to deal with that. The, as, as I said, NCD is rising. Epidemiological uh, uh, burdens are uh, you know, evolving. 
And I think the healthcare cost burdens have emerged as a very important concern, particularly for the poor and the vulnerable. They have a way of eroding your incomes. You may, through a livelihood programs, you can get income, but this healthcare cost burden, what's called out-of-pocket expenses, is a very important concern and we need solutions there. We need solutions on nutritional security. We used to talk of food security. I think increasingly we have to talk about nutritional security. And of course the climate risks requires us to look at multiple new ways to deal with this. And finally implementation priority. I think this will be one of the, pro, uh, one of the issues that the conference hopefully will come up with answers. But I think when you talk of a national strategy, it need not mean one program as such. But I think the approach could be in consolidation, certainly, around viable program pillars. That's the type of implementation priorities I would like to highlight. From regional experience, some lessons from regional experience, and I tap my own country's experience, Bangladesh, to uh, tell you about four innovations I want to highlight. I'm sure there are others. One is what we call the, you know, we, the word before social protection came popular, or it still is, is the safety net, safety nets. And I think in Bangladesh we have really tried also to innovate on the area of a net and ladder strategy. Net means preventing someone from falling down, but investing in human capital, etc., is also to get them out of poverty. So a net and ladder strategy, or what's called a graduation strategy. That is a very important policy shift in the context of Bangladesh, and there are viable programs, like the graduation programs of BRAC and others. Government also has adopted this. So a net and ladder strategy, I think, is one of the innovations that we could flag. There is also the importance of multi-use instrument. Instrument not for a particular goal only. For example, the vulnerable group feeding, it's a, a cards, it's an instrument uh, developed in the wake of the devastating floods of 1998 in Bangladesh. But it has come in handy for addressing either disaster or other types of needs, newer types of groups. For example, fishermen to preserve hilsha fishing are prevented from fishing for a period. So what do you do? During that ban period, they deploy this card for those particular communities to uh, overcome their difficulties. So I think the use of multi-use instrument is an important innovation we should be thinking about. And I think also we are increasingly talking of productive safety nets, workfare programs, etc. I think here Bangladesh also uh, experimenting that at the end of the day, you know, employment programs or workfare programs are good programs, but these have to choose particular types of schemes for them to be implemented. Otherwise, it can just become a transfer program. If they are to be productive program, the scheme choice is an important issue. And here in Bangladesh, we have actually looked at, unpacked the rural, uh, rural infrastructure needs, like a hierarchy of infrastructure needs from micro, micro infrastructures like the path between the two fields for the farmer to carry the load, getting that path a little better. Two, better, you know, connecting the village to the rural market town. So scheme choices and these multiple types of workfare program we have, the employment generation program, the food for works program, the uh, TR program, etc., etc. they actually link up they're looking at different types of infrastructural needs. Sometimes we have also successfully used these programs to drive agendas like social forestry, which was a different type of program. But so scheme choice, I think, is a very important concern that we need to keep in mind. And lastly, in the Bangladesh context, and I think it should be the same uh, everywhere, is that we need a very strong national poverty and vulnerability discourse to continuously support the formulation, the implementation, and the expansion of a social protection agenda. This is in Bangladesh. I myself was very strongly involved in this whole process. Uh, I think the, that came very handy for us to, for example, identify separate programs for the extreme poor, which was needed. 
then we needed the whole issue of geographic targeting as an important concern. All this came out of the, the urban poverty. These, all this came out of the poverty and active poverty and vulnerability discourse, which the planners and the implementers and the policymakers took on board. So I think that's a, uh, these are the four innovations I wanted to highlight from the Bangladesh experience. Now I just go to some uh, the detailed issue that at the end of the day, a national strategy is of course the starting point, very important, but implementation at the end of the day is very critical. And what are some of the implementation concerns which I need to flag, I think is very important, that institutional fragmentation of key services. Multiple agencies might be delivering the same service. So this institutional fragmentation is a concern. And here, integration is an issue. How do you achieve that? I think we need to think about it. There is this usual prog problem, the political economy prog problem of program capture and leakage concerns. You know, some programs you know, are meant to go to the poor, may not be going to the poor. And it is important to build in safeguards in terms of monitoring, in terms of design, in terms of the oversight to ensure that the money meant for the poor are going to the poor and the vulnerable. And the program capture and leakage concerns, it's an ongoing concern. We have to find effective solutions to that. We also need to be alert to the problem of low value for money contents. Sometimes we take on, for example, uh, in many programs in the Bangladesh context, Training has been added on as an additional component in some of the safety net programs. Some of the, uh, obviously training also has, uh, is a very important agenda, but if it is low value for money, then it's just expenditure. It's not really creating the further impact. I think we need to be concerned about which components are low value for money. We need to be really focused on that. Monitoring weakness, I have also already mentioned, and there is a tendency also for proliferation of token programs. We need to guard ourselves against just you know, small coverage, uh, not much of resource, but it's part of the list of the social protection programs. So the proliferation token programs is something we have to safeguard against. I conclude by trying to sort of bring to your notice some, what I thought, that succeeding on a national social protection strategy, what are the musts that we should highlight? We obviously need broad-based policy buy-in. That's a very critical issue. Social, and I think the very, as in, I would again applaud the presence of the finance minister here. It cannot be just the Department of Social Welfare or etc. It's a broad-based policy decision of the government of the state. So we need that broad-based policy buy-in. And as I said, integrated strategy need not mean a single unified program. I think that's an issue I'm sure will be debated. And from speaking from the experience of Bangladesh, we find success lies in combining multiple approaches. One is what I call strategic incrementalism meaning programs are working well, you try to build in new type of uh, angles to that whole issue. Uh, for example, stipend program in the, for the primary and secondary students in Bangladesh is working well. Whether to combine the school meal program there, those are type of issues we need to take on board. And scaling up uh, existing scalable programs, that's also true. And in countries, if they are opportunities for a big push from the political angle, one should also go for that. For example, Thailand in the 2000, they had this big push on the health you know, safety net. That happened because there was a political opportunity for a big push. And if such opportunities open up in our respective countries, we should be uh, alert and uh, 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 take on those opportunities in a uh, quick manner. And the issue of coordination, of course, is a constant word that we use, development partners, implementers, academics, consultants, all of us are always focused on coordination, but coordination how? 
I think that's an issue that we need to, and coordination is not just an administrative step. Coordination has to be through vision, through data, and through institutional conversation among key stakeholders. I think vision is provided by the uh, national strategy. Data is very important, social registry, the monitoring data, et cetera, et cetera. And you need a constant institutional conversation among key constitu uh, constituencies. And I think that that is the most effective path to deliver on coordination uh, and not to see it just as an administrative issue. Obviously, improved database of poor and program uh, beneficiaries is important, time-bound action plans are important. One point I haven't put in here is that the program design issues are also very really critical. Just to bear in mind the healthcare, health insurance. Let's say I was talking to the GIZ person here yesterday. Uh, Nepal, it seems, has uh, rolled out, trying to, but coverage is still very low. I think he mentioned 7% only. And health insurance type programs typically are plagued with high dropout rates. You know, people drop out. And here, I think design issues are very important. In the Bangladesh context, we are also in a state of policy, you know, conversation here. But whether it is important to, you know, uh, take perhaps for the poor and the vulnerable, the whole idea of healthcare safety nets, even if you're using the language of insurance, whether that may be a better route. So design, I think, is a very important issue. How you design the program will influence how successful you are likely to be. And, uh, and of course, at the end of the day, we need a sustainable financing strategy. This is very critical on drawing because many of these commitments are not just temporary commitments. These have to become integral part of the whole development and budgetary resources are important where, for example, health insurance not for the very poor and vulnerable, for they say the lower middle class, middle class, etc. Co-payment is also a new strategy. In the Bangladesh context, people are already paying 67% out of pocket, the out of pocket expense, 67% is actually by the people, which means the people are already paying. How do you tap some of these resources? And that's a final point I'll make. Uh, the uh, external grants are of course important and community contributions, like in the school meal in the Bangladesh context, we are trying to roll that out, getting the community to also shoulder some of the burdens these are so a sustainable financing strategy is important. I'll end on one final observation, is that in South Asia, all of the countries in South Asia, I think one very critical contextual feature is that our clientele, meaning the people, 10, 20, 30 years ago, their vision would be dominated by the word survival. To a large extent, still so. But increasingly, people in our areas, even the poor, are, are becoming aspirational. Policy, state, government, academics, all have to take on board that you are now confronting an aspirational citizenry, even among the poor. That's why the poor are paying out of their pocket for quality schooling for their children, because they realize that investing in human capital is critical. So we have to find ways to address this aspirational citizenry, find the needs that they prioritize, and where possible, also tap their willingness to pay sort of uh, attitude for programs uh, while, of course, uh, devoting the appropriate amount of national resources to that. So I think on that, this aspirational citizenry is a new reality and all our activities, social protection, planning, government as a whole, I think have to address this new uh, character of our clientele, of our citizens. And through that, we will fulfill hopefully this idea of a resilient, inclusive social protection and at the end of the day, I understand we also need to ensure prosperity and happiness. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hussain, for that insightful presentation. Next, I would like to call upon someone who has uh, 23 years of experience serving children and communities in a range of emergency, fragile, and development context. And uh, she's also joined UNICEF in 1996 as Child Protection Officer in Rwanda and subsequently served as Child Pr Protection Chief in Liberia. And she's also contributed in various countries and to name few Myanmar, Eastern Southern Africa, Madagascar, Northern Uganda, Afghanistan are a few of them. Uh, let me invite Ms. LK Whisk here on the podium. Let's give a very big round of applause and let's hear from her. Well, thanks for that uh, introduction um, and a very warm welcome and good morning to all of you in the room. Honorable Minister of Finance uh, and chief guest with us today at this conference, Dr. Jubarai Kativada and our key champion for social protection here in Nepal. Uh, our keynote speaker, Dr. Hussein Zilur Rahman, thank you so much for this very thought-provoking speech uh, that you just led us off with. The deputy country manager uh, of our colleagues at the World Bank, uh, my colleague Lisa Honan, head of DFID Nepal, uh, chair of our session, Do Dr. Ram Kumar Pujal, member of the National Planning Commission, colleagues and distinguished guests. It is a pleasure for me to be here today and to greet you on behalf of the Nepal Social Protection Task Team, which brings together development partners, uh, including colleagues from United Nations agencies and bilateral and other multilateral partners, committed to jointly supporting the government of Nepal in moving the social protection agenda forward in this beautiful country. It is wonderful and very energizing for me to see so many stakeholders from the government, from development partners, civil society, and the private sector gathered here in this room. Thank you for making the time in your busy schedules to join the strategic exchanges ahead. A special greeting also to an impressive range of social protection experts who have joined us from different corners of the world to enrich our experience exchanges over the coming two days. On behalf of the Social Protection Partnership that co-organized this conference jointly with the Government of Nepal, a very warm welcome to Kathmandu and thank you for making the long journeys to be with us to share your insights and expertise on resilient social protection for inclusive development, the theme of our deliberations aimed at supporting Nepal to deliver on its vision of a social protection system that will leave no one behind and thereby helping Nepal to become a more prosperous nation. Nepal has come a long way. The government of Nepal enshrined its vision to equality and leaving no one behind in the 2015 constitution. The strong commitment and leadership has been evident, particularly through the broad range of social protection measures put in place to date with a focus on economically and socially marginalized populations, including children, the elderly, single women, and people living with disabilities, uh, especially marginalized groups amongst society. The social security allowances are a vivid demonstration of this. Today, nearly three million citizens in Nepal receive regular cash transfers to help them cope with adversity and a range of shocks. The child grant, for example, was introduced in 2009 to support better nutrition for children under five years of age in an effort to contribute to tackling the exceedingly high stunting rates in Nepal. The program was initially introduced to support vulnerable children under the age of five, in particularly vulnerable communities. Since then, 
successive governments have taken decisive action to continuously expand the program to more and more families and their children across the country. Most recently, the government of Nepal has made a commitment to continue with this expansion with the aim to reaching universal child grant coverage. Nepal is also committed to making social protection schemes more flexible and adaptable as a rapid and efficient means to assist in communities affected by natural disasters to help them cope with these increasingly regular shocks. In 2016, the government of Nepal, with our support, provided a direct cash transfer to support communities affected by the devastating earthquake to cope with the shock and facilitate their recovery. Taking advantage of the existing social protection system, the program reached vulnerable communities at a time of particular need and demonstrated that integrating shock adaptation and disaster preparedness into the regular system leads to operational efficiency gains and creates programmatic synergies along the humanitarian development nexus. We salute this progress in providing social protection safety nets and the undeniable impact these measures have had on key social indicators, such as the impressive decline in the under five mortality and stunting rates and the increase in birth registration over the past few decades. As we salute the progress made so far, we note that many challenges remain to close the gap and before we reach the common goal of leaving no one behind in Nepal. As various social protection schemes are being rolled out and expanded, we recognized that with this progress come opportunities to further strengthen and integrate the social protection schemes to developing a system of social protection that is speedier, more flexible, and more efficient. Key questions to tackle are how to create the necessary fiscal space to realize the scale-up, how to best set up the institutional mechanisms in an emerging federalized context, how to better integrate the various existing social protection measures and schemes across a range of ministries and government departments through a coherent strategy, a joint framework, and coordination mechanism in efforts to facilitate horizontal coverage expansion and further scale up. And last but not least, how to further develop the system to make it more flexible and adaptable to ensure shock responsiveness and readiness in times of disaster. The coming days provide the opportunity to exchange on these key questions, to share experiences and lessons learned from Nepal as well as from other contexts and to jointly deliberate on the solutions and reinforce our joint commitment to moving the social protection agenda forward to Nepal. In conclusion, a vote of thanks to our chief guest and champion of social protection, the Honorable Min Minister of Finance, Dr. Jubarai Kadiwada, and to the cross-section of government line ministries collaborating in the organization of the strategic exchange. Special thanks also to all the development partners who have partnered on organizing this event, notably our colleagues from the World Bank, uh, UK Aid, DFID, ILO, UNDP, UNSCAP, GIZ German Co uh, Cooperation, and the Social Science Baha, as well as, of course, my colleagues at UNICEF. I look forward to hearing and learning from the collective wisdom gathered here in this room and to a fruitful exchange that will lead to concrete action on the ground with communities where it matters most. Thank you again for your energy and commitment to inclusive social protection and for contributing actively to this exchange. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. L.K. Wisk, uh, for that uh, wonderful remark. Now I would like to call upon Mr. Bigyan Pradhan, who is the Acting Country Manager of World Bank Nepal here, to share his talk on this particular inaugural session.
Thank you. Uh, good morning and namaste. Honorable uh, Finance Minister and Chief Guest of the Ceremony, Dr. Yuvraj Khatiwada. Honorable Member of the National Planning Commission and Chair of this session, Dr. Ram Kumar Foyal. Distinguished speakers in the dais representing various agencies, excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, on behalf of the World Bank Country Director for Nepal, Sri Lanka and Maldives, Ida, who due to unavoidable circumstances could not attend this ceremony, but she has sent her best wishes for the successful outcome of this conference on social protection. <clears throat> we at the World Bank have been working with the government of Nepal for the past decade on the social protection agenda. We are pleased to see that our partnership has led to progress in modernization of core social protection delivery systems, including the shift to more effective electronic payments. <clears throat> in the past few years, statistics reveal that living conditions of Nepali households have improved substantially. Poverty rates have declined dramatically. However, it is to be noted that many in Nepal still struggle to feed and house their families, send their children to school, and obtain the healthy care they need. Disparities across groups are very large when it comes to access to opportunities. Geography plays an important role, but also ethnicity and gender. Nepal still has a long way to go to ensure everyone has equal access to opportunities. The youth and low-skilled adults struggle to find quality jobs as Nepal's labor force is overwhelmingly rural and informal, and wage employment is concentrated in urban areas. In addition, increasingly more frequent natural disasters put Nepali households at risk. Nepal unfortunately regularly encounter floods, landslides, and sometimes earthquakes. Natural disasters have disproportional impact on the poor and can push vulnerable and non-poor into poverty. Disasters can also have long-term negative impacts in particular for children's nutrition, health, and schooling outcomes. Strong economic growth is essential to help addressing these issues, but it is not enough. Social protection has a fundamental role to play to promote a more just, equitable, and inclusive society. Social protection can help people build resilience, protect people from poverty, help households invest in human capital accumulation, and cope with disasters. Nepal stands, Nepal already spends a substantial amount of funds on social protection, close to 4% of the GDP. However, the intended ob objectives of this spending are not always clear. Are the programs aimed at building household resilience? Are they aiming to reduce poverty or help people access services? I hope this con conference helps the policy thinkers think about some of the main ways that social protection programs in Nepal can be more effective. Further, it is also important to bring more clarity on the objectives of social protection program in Nepal, which would help prioritize the spending and review the design of these programs. Clarifying the objectives would help to think about outreach at the current programs to all the poor and vulnerable with the right time, type and amount of benefits. Our interactions with the government on social protections are with multiple agencies as the programs and policies are scattered across many. I hope this conference also helps us to think about how to integrate and consolidate the programs and policies in terms of institutional leadership. One core element of integrated social protection is an integrated social registry linked to a unique ID system which will allow the government to better identify who is at risk, who is receiving benefits, and monitor, <clears throat> monitor the impact of the program in a systematic way. I believe that we will hear examples of 
integrated systems and examples of federal countries, which is very important given Nepal's recent transition to a federal structure. Fiscal sustainability of social protection expenditure is also a key concern. Recognizing this, the government has initiated some reforms. The public sector pension, which constitutes about half of the total social protection expenditures, will be contributory for all new recruits into the civil service. In the medium term, this should ease the fiscal burden. In addition, the government is also taking important steps towards increasing efficiency of the delivery systems. This includes delivering social security allowances through banking system instead of moving of individual government officials for delivering cash. Similarly, for the social security allowances, the government has already digitized the database of all 2.9 uh, million beneficiaries. But there are probably more efficiency gains which can be made. We don't have the answers. But with all the expertise in this room, I wish fruitful discussions during the coming two days. We would like to use concrete, actionable plan coming out of this conference. We look forward to the conclusions of this conference and to continue our support to the government so as it develops strong social protection programs and policy for all Nepalese. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Began. Now, moving forward uh, with the speakers, uh, next speaker I would like to invite. Uh, she arrived as head of DFID Nepal in July 2019, and she was before that the governor of St. Helena, Ascension, and Christinda uh, Kuna from April 2016 uh, to May 2019, being the first female in 400 years. Uh, she was previously head of office uh, for DFID Kenya, and she is long-term DFID member of staff and particularly champions women and diversity issues. Let's welcome uh, Miss Lisa Honan here on the dais. Let's give a very big round of applause, everybody. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that welcome. I should probably clarify, I wasn't the first woman on St. Helena, I was the first female governor. Um, <laughs> I think we need to change the biography. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, good morning everyone and good morning to the Honourable Minister of Finance, Excellencies, colleagues, distinguished guests. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm delighted that my organisation, DFID, UK Aid, is supporting this conference. But I'm most delighted that I'm in the presence of so many social protection experts. Um, and I'm looking forward to the outcome of these two days with great enthusiasm. Um, my organisation, DFID, we support the government of Nepal's vision for a prosperous Nepal and happy Nepali. Um, prosperous, happy countries have effective social protection systems and the most prosperous and happy countries have the largest social protection systems and that's why we support this agenda all over the world. But today and tomorrow, we need to convert this expertise and enthusiasm in the room into practical action. As my colleague from UNICEF, Elka, said, we need concrete actions from this. So I'd like to set you some, a work program. I'd like to see, um, four things coming out of this conference and I hope that the Minister will also endorse me in setting this homework for you. I believe we need a vision for social protection in Nepal and my organisation DFID would be very happy to support that work. We need a vision that has a clear set of objectives for why the government of Nepal and us as development partners are investing in social protection. 
we need a single government institution to be the leader on social protection policy and delivery in Nepal. And we need to be able to monitor progress towards our objectives. And we want to work with the government as a development partner to make sure that everyone in Nepal can get their constitutional right to social protection, particularly the poor and vulnerable. And we need to build on the great work that the government's done so far to help deliver even better for more people. Because as has been mentioned before, Nepal has a large and well-established social protection system. It works and it is delivering and it's improving. But we know there are also challenges. There are challenges for the government at different levels to deliver. And there are challenges for the most marginalized in society from getting the benefits from the very support they need. So as you do your work program over the new, next two, year, two days that we've set you, please bear in mind some of these examples. First of all, we know that women face specific constraints in terms of receiving information about social protection schemes. This is most serious for women from marginalized castes and women with disabilities. Second, women and girls have lower rates of birth registration and documentation. And we know that makes it more difficult for them to access the various schemes. And third, women tend to have lower mobility and limited access to services. And that's exacerbated for Dalit women and women and girls with disability. Social protection in Nepal certainly does address some of these issues. It does address vulnerability and it does increase women's mobility. It increases their exposure to public and private institutions and it improves their financial inclusion and their literacy. But it could do this more systematically and more effectively. And we know that if carefully designed and implemented social protection can promote even better outcomes for those most vulnerable people. So to sum up, we see social protection as a key mechanism for realizing the government of Nepal's vision. We want to see action from this conference, setting the objectives, the institutional arrangements for social protection in Nepal. And we, as DFID and as the UK, are ready to support the government's uh, vision in delivering social protection for the people of this country. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Honan. Now next, I would like to call upon uh, the chief guest of our event, your conference here today. Uh, talking about him, Honorable Minister, Dr. Yuvraj Khatiwada. He's uh, the member of National Assembly of the Federal Parliament and has held the position of Minister of Finance uh, since March 2018. Uh, he also uh, was twice in this position of the Vice Chairman of the National Planning Commission. Um, beside that, he has also served as the Governor of the Nepal Rashtra Bank. He has also served as the UN system as a senior economist in the regional center of UNDP for Asia and the Pacific in 2006 and 2009. Uh, he also served the government as a member of the National Planning Commission. And of course, very pleased to have you one more time uh, with great pleasure. Let's welcome Honorable Minister of Finance, Dr. Yuvraj Khatiwara. Let's give a very big round of applause. Uh, 
chairperson of this program, uh, honorable member of the planning commission, uh, uh, heads of DFID, UNICEF, World Bank, uh, keynote speaker, uh, Mr. Rahman, uh, distinguished delegates, colleagues and friends, very pleased to be with you this morning. Uh, and uh, on behalf of the government of Nepal, let me also extend my warm welcome to all of you. And uh, I expect this conference to have very useful suggestions to the policy makers of this region uh, to move ahead with resilient and sustainable social protection system. Uh, let me recall the 18th SARC summit uh, we had in Kathmandu back in the year 2014, when all the heads of the SARC governments, they vowed together that the SARC countries adopt common social protection strategy. And the, and the chair country Nepal was supposed to draft a paper uh, for the consideration of the rest of the member countries to be discussed in the 19th SARC summit supposed to be held in Islamabad. That has not taken place yet, but the social protection action plan is ready to the consideration of all the uh, member states. And during my professional life, I had the opportunity to work on that. So the draft social protection action plan for the region is ready. So let me now recall what we did in that respect and what we expect SARC countries to do uh, in common so far as social protection is concerned because this session is for social protection in South Asia. And I focus on the SARC countries in general. Let's recall what are the common issues in SARC states. Poverty, declining, of course, significantly declining, but still we have pockets of poverty and we have hard to reach people in terms of addressing their poverty and exclusion. So the most difficult task is still ahead. Nepal was able to reduce poverty by more than one percentage point every year during the last two decades. Part of the credit goes to social protection programs. I don't claim that all goes to the social protection programs, but part of that reduction in poverty by at least one percentage point a year, that also at a time when the country was in deeper conflict and also in a long political transition, and that achievement was done with several other social engineering is taking place along with the government programs of social protection. So I think that is something to be noted. Similar was, I think, the achievement made in poverty reduction in several of the South Asian countries. But I must also mention here that inequality, although reducing in several of our countries, actually the improvement in inequality reduction is not as much as what we expect as of today. And had there been no worsening income distribution, our outcome in product poverty reduction would have been much, much higher. Perhaps Nepal itself would have been able to reduce poverty by at least 1.5 percentage point a year. So. If we really want to get benefit of growth in terms of poverty reduction, we have to see that income distribution is a key aspect. And on that, I don't need to mention that social protection would, would be a key intervention so far as income distribution is concerned. And that exactly is what the previous keynote speaker has already mentioned. The other aspect I would like to touch upon, which is common in South Asia, is vulnerability. It's not only vulnerability to climate or climate change or some kind of natural disaster. The vulnerability emanates from global shocks, economic shocks. The region is quite prone to international financial shocks. And it happens 
used to happen every decade in the past. I don't know how, how frequently it happens now. I can see some sense, some signals already in the field. And these kind of international shocks would translate into economic slowdown, loss of jobs, loss of some other capacity of the state to scale up social protection, and perhaps that would result in the slowdown in poverty reduction, at least, if not increases in poverty. So, the vulnerability in terms of natural disaster shocks, everything are common to this region, and we must see that we have the resilience, we have the coping capacity through our credible social protection programs that the situation doesn't worsen or people have the resilience to cope such kind of vulnerability, whether it's climate-based or it is financial or economic system or economic relations-based. The other dimensions of vulnerability in the region are risk associated with our livelihoods, agriculture, except for a few countries in the region. I exclude Maldives. Most of the countries in the region have their livelihood in agriculture. And agriculture is mostly monsoon fed, rainfall fed. It's very vulnerable. We have seen droughts and floods. They are very common. People are displaced, crops are damaged, and people are indebted because they cannot repay the bank loan uh, for the, because they don't have their crops to market and then to earn any income. And then the crop insurance schemes are very limited. And their coverage is very low. In Nepal, uh, even, uh, not even 5% of the farmers are covered by any kind of crop insurance. And there are other, other kind of uh, risks associated with agriculture which cannot be insured, just like the market prices. And when there are market price failures, most of the households, particularly in a country like ours where nearly two-thirds of the population is agriculture-based, they are most vulnerable to their livelihoods. So this agriculture-based, which is still a risky occupation because some of these activities cannot be insured and also is also weather-based agriculture. Labor market, mostly informal. The informal labor markets create a lot of issues. Your introduction of formal labor market schemes, social security schemes in the labor market has very limited coverage because you, the formal market is very, very small. In my own country, it's less than one third and most of the labor market activities are informal. And even if we introduce informal labor market social protection schemes, it's so difficult to implement it, to make employers comply to the schemes and to do monitorings. So formalization of the informal labor market would be a key issue in the region and we have to see how that can take place at a time when the global labor market scenario is in the reverse gear, trying to re informalize the formal labor market outsourcing, out-contracting. Sometimes even we call it bogus contracts because there is always third party who is doing contracts for labor for you as an employer. And we don't know any labor market related welfare schemes observed transparently for the workers. Even wages, they are sometimes suppressed and there is gender biases in wages. In Nepal, women get one-third less than what men get in labor market activities. So, this is also the result of informalization or informal labor market condition, and the region is very much prone to this kind of activities. Add to that the cross-border migration of workers. There is large informal flow of migrant workers across the border, and in South Asia, most of the countries, despite of several restrictions, people move here and there. And how do we ensure minimum social protection to the migrant worker could be an issue for regional cooperation. It cannot only be a country concern. The cross-border issues have to be collectively resolved from regional initiatives. And one country initiative cannot solve this problem. And this is growing also because of growing integration 
We know SARC is not a much integrated region in the world. We are the least integrated region in the world. But still, our informal, semi-formal activities are on the rise. Investments, cross-country investments are rising. Only trade issues are, to some extent, restricted. So, in such a situation, we need to see how the regional initiatives on social protection, particularly when it is concerned to labor market, would be addressed. Cross-border health issues, cross-border disaster issues, they are also some of the issues which we need to resolve collectively through common social protection programs. There are several other issues on which we could delve a lot in terms of the initiatives uh, for regional cooperation. But let me take this opportunity to share with you what really works when we are talking about resilient social protection and what doesn't work. And I think meetings like this, conferences and discourses like this would be the best opportunity to share our experiences and learn from each other what has worked and what has not. Actually, in South Asia, we each other have learned a lot in social protection. I don't claim who did the social protection initiative first, but the history itself tells how it was done. Old age benefits, almost almost all South Asian countries opting for it, which is a kind of universal social protection for old age population, irrespective of their income or any other social status or economic status. Child benefits. Similarly, health insurances. And recently, and I would say more focused area is the shelter housing is being undertaken uh, by some of the countries in the region with greater success. Employment guarantee scheme. How is it working? It's working good. There are a lot of criticisms on employment guarantee schemes, but still it is working. It's ensuring food and income to the people who are in perhaps sometimes in a very desperate situation. And this is something which helps to create public infrastructure with the labor and local resources we have. So these kind of things I, we have seen across uh, South Asia are examples which could be replicated and implemented by respective countries. There are many more schemes which we can continue. Uh, having said that, I would also like to mention that if our social protection programs are credible, and if they are sustainable. No matter how many governments keep on changing, the programs continue. I take example from my own country, Nepal, the old age benefit. It started back in 1995. We were so much criticized for that. It's too much redistributive, it's a wastage, it's just like consumption, uh, taxes being misutilized, every blame that then government has to face. And coincidentally, then also uh, the same party which led the government is ruling now. And I am the finance minister of that party who initiated that old age benefit back in 1995. Today I asked the same question to my colleagues. What are your criticisms now? Nobody, nobody criticizes it but asks to increase the amount, reduce the eligibility age. We started with year 75 then gradually reduced to 70, now they are asking for 65. Whereas our longevity is, has increased from about 65 to 71. So, the, the takeaway is that credible programs right from 95 to today are surviving in Nepal irrespective of change of government at least once in a year. There have been at least 20 governments in 20 years and still the credible programs are surviving. That means you must design, we must design our program in such a way that this can resist any kind of political turmoil, any kind of political or government change. 
In fact, during uh, the last two decades, we have changed our political regime. It's not only the government, even we change the political regime. But our social protection programs are intact. That applies to child benefit. That applies to several other social protection programs that includes health and education programs, livelihood programs, and so on and so forth. So this is something uh, to, be, to, to take away uh, from our experiences. The second experience, as my colleague from UNICEF remarked, when you have already a network of social protection, you can always scale up those kind of protection at the time of crisis or disaster. And that's exactly what UNICEF did in Nepal during the time of post-disaster, post-earthquake situation. We had the system. We had the mechanism. So if you really want to grant more subsidy or support or transfer to the children, you could do it because you have already had institution. So having an institutional framework for social security, whatever nascent, whatever small intervention it is, the mechanism has to be there. And at the time of crisis, disaster, vulnerability, whatever, if you really want to scale up your operation, you have the institution, you have the mechanism, you have the procedure, and you can readily do it. So that's the second takeaway that I want to share at this moment. Uh, the Employment Guarantee Scheme. Nepal had just started, but we all know that employment is the best form of social protection for the working people who can be integrated in the labor market. So for the working labor force who are unemployed, the best way is to provide them the jobs. Only when we cannot provide them the jobs, we should be providing with some kind of social security in terms of uh, some cash transfers. But that is the least priority and uh, the, the last option that we should be resorting to. We can learn a lot from our neighboring countries in terms of employment guarantee and see that empowering workforce and also making social protection system a resilient system would call for a job-centric growth process and just addressing the mismatch in the labor market. We create jobs which are not always amenable or liked by the labor force or the, or the human resources we create in the country. So a great mismatch. A skill and a kind of some kind of orientation, some kind of incubation, sometimes of scaling up of our efforts to integrate those people into the labor market would be important aspect. Otherwise, in many of our countries of our region, the jobs we have created uh, is grabbed by people uh, who are not uh, the citizens of the country. So we have to see that employment guarantee scheme really works and the employment that we create through several social protection schemes, uh, even through the human capital formation schemes, go to the people who really deserve the kind of employment. I think this is something which we can take up. Uh, the fiscal instruments for social protection, tax and subsidies, tax and cash transfers, how we design our programs. Look at the fiscal side. The fiscal policy is totally blunt. The monetary policy is totally blunt in terms of their progressivity and in terms of their targeted focus on the, on the people who have to be protected. What does monetary policy do? I have run the central bank. I was a carrier central banker and I, I was the governor of central bank for five years. Tried to address some of the social issues through microfinance schemes, through some other targeted credit programs. But my, many of my fellow colleagues said that this is intervention in the market. Let market function on its own. And then the argument was that everybody can grab the opportunity of the market whereby there are there is unequal citizenry. I don't know how they want to address this. Equal opportunities for unequal citizens. That was something to be addressed. And we need to see that markets basically function, but when markets don't function, there should be a role of the public sector and the government to see that. Let market function well first. If not, you have to intervene. I see not much space uh, to be indifferent to such a situation when markets are 
not treating everybody and not providing opportunity to all on an equal basis. The taxation front, there are single or two or three taxes in income. We say that the smaller the rates of the taxes, the smaller the tax labs, the fewer the number of tax rates, the better the tax system. So we have lost progressivity in the tax system. We have resorted more to the indirect taxes like value added tax or GST, and they are regressive. So you opt for regressive taxation system, collect revenue, and go for universal social protection, helping the rich. Does it necessarily redistribute income to the positive side, or does it make more harm? Because you are taxing people through indirect taxes, which is, which is payable by all kind of population irrespective of income, and you are doing social protection on a universal basis without targeting and providing protection to the people who don't necessarily need that up resources. So we have to see social protection as a tool of income redistribution must be applied with proper taxation tools, otherwise it would be counterproductive also. Both the targeting in the, in the, in the other side of the recipient side and proper taxation in the, in the fiscal side I think this is somewhere we can deb debate. And do we really need to go into social security tax then? And applying this tax to the richer population. But in countries where politician, politics is grabbed by rich people everywhere, in the political leadership or in the parliament, and you want to tax property or income at a higher level, you have to, you, you feel the brunt of the criticism. Can a finance minister really cope this? This is a challenge to a politician who want to see that a progressive tax system works and a security, social security tax works for financing our social protection program. I haven't seen much of this initiative in South Asia so far as social security tax is concerned. But if you really want to have social protection uh, resilient and a sustainable kind of intervention, I think we need to work on that and see what can be done to see a kind of exclusive tax system which finances social protection schemes of the governments of the region. Let me touch upon quickly on some of the other issues which are our takeaways. The informal social protection system. That's the beauty of Asian countries. The family system, the systems of trust, religious institutions, communities, they are fantastic. They are providing, providing lot of social protection through their own communities, families, and societies. We must strengthen them, build them, and wherever possible, try to formalize them. And if not, try to complement, try to complement formal social protection schemes with the informal ones. Like the old age housings. The communities have done old age housing for the elderly population who don't have their children to take care of them. Government can top up to them, support them in their endeavors. When in business we do VGF, just like our keynote speaker was mentioning, the viability gap funding. Sometimes the social protection gap funding could also be done by the government. We can do this. So a complementary role between informal social protection headed or, or initiated by the society with the formal social protection scheme that the government is undertaking have to be complemented. They have to be taken together. And it's not that every social protection activity has to be done by the public sector. You cannot do it in a country when we have resource limitation. So let's, let's see a complementarity and partnership. And exactly this is the point where SDGs are talk, when SDGs are talking about inclusion and sustainable societies. So I think this kind of complementarity should also be sought in a setting of informal social protection in a country, in countries like ours in South Asia. Uh, another issue is balancing between productive social protection schemes and distributive social protection schemes. Or just a balance between contributory social security systems and non-contributory social security system. 
how do we balance between contributory and non-contributory income generating and consumption oriented social protection schemes this is the challenge to policy makers the keynote speaker was talking about some of the contributory social security schemes like the health insurance in my own country nearly 55 percent of the health expenditure is out of pocket so if you really say that this is too much can we really have some other fiscal space to create resources so that we don't want anybody to spend their own out-of-pocket money for, public, for their health expenses? Is it possible? How much it will take in terms of the total budget if you really say that all health services would be universal and any kind of disease, NCD or otherwise, should be covered by the state? And having said that, our uh, social protection expenditure should not also exceed a certain limit of the budget because we also have several other things to do like infrastructure and economic services and also other social services like education and health services and there are also many more fundamental rights of the citizens like in my own country Nepal which has to be addressed by government resources so then we have to think how the balance between contributory and non-contributory productive and welfare oriented activities be balanced. I think this forum should come up with some of the uh, uh, common understanding about these issues. Uh, we, we cannot be overly idealistic in saying that everything has to be covered by the state. In a society where private sector is doing its job also relatively effectively in education, in health, in some of the social sector activities, they are equally important. And they are more important in economic sectors. Now, our, our job is to see that more of the private sector investment comes in the infrastructure sector, so that we can create some more fiscal space to also have wider coverage in social protection. So bringing in, bringing in private sector in most of the physical, economic, and some of the social sector activities would mean that government have some more resources to spare for the social protection schemes. So you have to restructure. We have to restructure our budget also and our policies also in such a way that the most of the jobs that private sector can do in a business model have to be entrusted to the private sector itself and the government can take up some of the responsibilities which private sector cannot commercially do. But having said that, we must also mention that they also have their corporate social responsibility. They also have their uh, social business perspectives that we must honor and we must encourage and they should also be paying taxes uh, to the extent that the government can expand social protection schemes. So expanding fiscal space in South Asia in particular where most governments are in budget deficit already, where the tax rates are reasonably high, uh, tax uh, incidence is reasonably high and you have still to create more space to that only means that we have to restructure our spending and be more forceful to increase the tax base without increasing the rates. So on that I think uh, a fiscal space creation could be discussed also and uh, that could be also a good opportunity for us to get takeaway uh, from your discourses. Uh, I was supposed to uh, address some of the other issues as well, but uh, my own time is not permitting me uh, to speak longer. Uh, I do hope that uh, this conference uh, would be a very good opportunity to learn each other and also to guide the governments, the policy makers in terms of uh, designing social protection schemes which are sustainable, which help reduce poverty, which help reduce vulnerability, which help increase welfare, and which also help increase human capital, and also sustain livelihood uh, to better living of the society and people in the region. With this, I conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, our Honorable Dr. Yuvraj Khatiwada, Minister of Finance, and uh, of course, the chief guest of our event here today. Um, 
Well, now it's time. Uh, we call the chair of the session. I would like to invite Honorable Dr. Ram Kumar Fuyal, member of National Planning Commission here for the final remark and then we'll go further. I would like to also request to all the speakers to uh, um, note that we'll have a 20 minutes break and then uh, we'll start the sessions. But please uh, make sure that you're on time so that we can wrap the event and sessions and make the most out of the time that we have marked for each session. Thank you. With that, let's invite one more time Honorable Dr. Ram Kumar Fuyal here on the dais. Chief Guest, Honorable Finance Minister, Dr. Yuvadraj Khatiyoda, Distinguished Speaker on the DAS, Excellencies, High-Level Government Officials, Distinguished International and National Speaker, Valued Guest, Respectable Representatives from different organization and institutions, media person, civil societies, and ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor and privilege for me to be a part of this organizing committee in this special event this morning at Kathmandu. I would like to welcome all of our distinguished participants once again. Your presence here is a reflection of the important and universal concern on resilient social protection for inclusive, inclusive development in the region. I'm confident that the time you will be spending at this conference over the next two days will be very much remarkable and valuable. I just would like to begin with the remarks made by our distinguished speakers right before as our finance ministers spoken, the resilient social protection schemes is to be more productive, still resilient, and operable to the peoples. And it should be also sustainable for the futures. Especially the speakers in the session focus more about what would be the right policy to institutionalize the social protection schemes in the implementation level. Is there any defect in the policy? Or is there any problem with the institutions? Or is there any hurdles, or duplication, or misunderstanding among the implementing agencies or sectors? This two are the big questions, which has been raised by almost all our very respected and esteemed speakers in this session. So, I am also in the same line. My remarks and my observations are not far from that. So, in this line, on highlighting the key points, starting with the old age pension or allowances and followed by the various schemes in the context of Nepal, we have come a long way in last two and a half decades. Now, there is a strong political commitment and country has got a very progressive constitutions. So, in constitutions, government regulation and policies, and even the periodic plan, the social protection issues have been very highly highlighted. So, 
the time now is to discuss about how to make it more, I mean, implementationable at right time to the right person in a right way. So this is a debate that we will discuss more rigorously in the policy debate sessions and at the same time we have parallel sessions in research papers presentations so we hope some of the insightful outcomes will come in the afternoon and the tomorrow's discussions especially we are thinking of focusing on right base need base and contribution based social protection schemes but we have to also sacrifice it properly which scheme will be on which particular groups and how it can be sustainable. At this situation, countries need to tailor their systems to the specific need of their populations and can move in the progressive manners towards goals, especially I am talking about the regions. So we have also the similar situations and similar cases, so we can sort it out and implement it through the process. Basically, social protection need to balance three dimensions to achieve universalism. If we go or if we enter into the universalism, it shall cover the whole population. It has to address all the major risks people are exposed to, especially the poor people, and it has to provide protection at the financially adequate level. That was also discussed in the session. Through, though at different levels of maturity, these programs already provide the significant special social protection coverage to the population. Government of Nepal, through national planning commissions and ministries are leading policy formulation works and working for the implementation strategies respectively. Looking back at the now coordination and coherence mechanism, social protection is dealing with different types of risks. So by nature, social protection programs are often implemented by different sectors authorities, as is also the case here in Nepal. A range of sectoral ministries are involved as well as different levels of government from national ministries to local level. At the policy level, the cross-sectional nature bears the challenge of creating a coherent approach towards universal social protection. And at the implementation level, the foremost issue is coordination of the multiple sectors involved. Experiencing how the social protection shows the integrated information management is still a risk. And we have to pop up with those problems identifying through our research and development process. Nepal is just in the process of building up a digital civil registry and a mechanism for poverty targeting which shall solve many different social protection programs. Both could form the nucleus for integrated information system. While talking about efficiency and financial sustainability, which was spoken before also, funding the ambitious goals requires bold decision on financing. International experience suggests a level of about five to 10 percentage of GDP for financing basic social protections in low income countries. Currently, Nepal devotes quite a considerable proportion of the budget that is approximately about 12% budget of 12% uh, national budgets 
this year's to social protections and has also good support by development partners. However, both does not at reach to the exact necessary levels. Our aim is to ensure social protection coverage of around 60% populations in the next five years periodic plan. In the short term, development partners, multilateral institutions, and development banks play a key role in supporting the expansion of social protections, particularly in early stages when countries incur high initial cost in setting of systems and building capacity. In the long term strategies, however, need to include a plan for gradually phasing out external supports and increasing the government contributions gradually. Distinguished guests and participants, I would also like to share with you that the government of Nepal has set up some basic intervention strategies in its five years periodic plan. They are like government has a plan to make a strong interventions on increasing the access of areas, groups, and communities that are under socio-economic marginalization and threat through the expansion of social assistance and protection mechanism. Similarly, government is addressing the fundamental rights of citizens through integrated social security packages. In the same way, government is working to make the contribution-based social security all-inclusive by integrating the informal sectors along with the formal one which was also spoken by our Honorable Finance Minister right before. And third strategy is to develop intergovernmental information system to make a coordination and collaboration between federal, provincial and local levels effective in social security assistance and protection program. By developing this can be done by developing integrated social protection framework and solid information mechanism to deliver different services of social protections. With this all, we expect that the following two days values conference will come up with the valid findings and recommendations through rigorous discourse and discussions among all the participants and experts on different six policy dialogues and research papers, presentations to support in building the evidence-based social protections policy in Nepal. Finally, what we believe is our Honorable Finance Minister spoken that social protection can save countries, enhance human capital and productivity, reduce productivity and inequality, and contributes to inclusive growth and building a social harmony. So I'm very much thankful to all the collaborative partners of this event for their long standing support and contribution to organize this valued event. And let me conclude my remarks wishing you fruitful deliberation over the next two days. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ram Kumar Foyal. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time we take a short break. It's going to be of only 20 minutes since I think our break according to the time here set is already over. And thank you one more time to all the panelists here present here. I